So looking at some of Lexington's data, looking at, at other cities, uh, uh, peer cities, and how we might compare on a couple of metrics. Um, so when I did that, just, uh, it, it became clear to me that Lexington seemed to be um, uh, uh, outperforming other cities on some of these um, data sets that I was looking at. So if you looked at um, violent crime, for example, Lexington had some very low violent crime rates. Um, looking at arts and cultural uh, institutions, you can look at arts and cultural institutions per capita, Lexington was sort of off the charts um, on this measure. And on and on, and the, the more data sets I, um, I gathered, there seemed to be a pattern. Um, and what I did was I found that there were other cities around the country that had the same pattern. It's as if they had the same DNA. Um, and the, uh, with, with similar results in, in, their, in their data sets. Um, and they were college, former college towns like Lexington that had grown up, had a, a major research university in the center of their city. Um, so the cities you see here, Ann Arbor, Durham Chapel, Fort Collins, Lexington, Lincoln, and Madison, they all <clears throat> started to look like large coastal cities in some ways. So they had um, lots of arts and culture, very highly educated population, um, an entrepreneurial economy, so business starts that are uh, per capita that are off the charts, um, and this resiliency after the recession. So coming out of the recession, uh, the Great Recession, 2008, 2010, it was only the largest cities in the countries and the, and the um, university cities that were really um, powering through and, and gaining jobs. And we're going to hear more about that, uh, one of some of the reasons beh behind that in a, in a moment. So it started to, to mirror these large cities in these important aspects, but were unlike the large cities, the large coastal cities, in, in that there was tends to be very low unemployment in these cities, uh, low, violent, low violent crime as well, and uh, generally a low, a low cost of living, although we'll hear, we'll hear more about that from, from Shay. Um, so what this did is it led us as, as policymakers to um, rethink some of what we were doing. So here in Lexington, for example, it led us to this idea that we wanted to pursue being a gigabit city, right? We have this, it's clear from the university city's research that we have a, a thriving knowledge economy um, here in Lexington. So we're really poised for, um, for growth in the 21st century knowledge economy. And part of the, the fuel for knowledge economy is connectivity and fiber, um, where ideas can connect with other people and to the broader world. And so we, uh, that's when Mayor Gray said, we are going to become a gigabit city. Uh, it wasn't clear how we were going to do that. Uh, others, there's only one other city that had done that. Um, but four years later, just this past, um, just this past year, we announced that there was a, a $70 million investment from a company called Metronet to create a citywide fiber optic network here in, in Lexington. And they have been, it's a three-year uh, construction project. They just turned on their first customers. Um, and at the end of the day, um, we're going to be the largest, Lexington will be the largest gigabit city in the country. Um, but there's much more to understand about university cities. Um, and so that's why I could not be more excited to have uh, this group with us here, here today to, to talk about the, the research that, uh, that they've been conducting. Um, so first I want to introduce Shay O'Neill to my left here. Um, Shay is uh, an adjunct professor at Thomas Jefferson University. He teaches advanced level courses in um, geographic information systems. He also serves as a research manager for U3 Advisors, which as I mentioned before, works with universities on real estate and economic development solutions uh, in their cities. And he's going to talk about uh, whether the definition uh, of university cities should be expanded. And then he's going to um, help us understand what makes these cities thrive. So, Jay, off to you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks again for having us. To anyone here who is from Knight, I don't know too many faces, but thank you for the generous research grant that allowed us to do this. Um, I also want to say thanks to Kim Tans right here. This is a coworker of mine who was uh, invaluable in putting together this research paper. So she's on photograph and support duty right now, but I wouldn't have been able to be up here um, without her. <coughs> so I now need to not talk and connect. Hold on. <clears throat> so one thing, I'm going to try something 
slightly different than what I've tried in a presentation before today. Um, we've started recently as uh, a company using Tableau. Does anyone in here use Tableau or know of this software app? It's awesome. I would highly recommend do the do the kind of pre thing if you if you get it. It has sort of changed the way we visualize and look at data. Um, so because of that, or one could say laziness at not wanting to build a new presentation from scratch, I'm going to be jumping in between a presentation and a couple of Tableau workbooks so I can actually show some of our data a little bit live and, and how it flows. So as with any new idea, the, uh, you know, the gap between execution and conception is often broad. So please give me a little latitude if you wouldn't mind. Um, so we left last year's conference uh, knowing that there were six university cities we were um, really intrigued by this concept, the idea that uh, it's got it mentioned that they are innovative, that they have solid um, and resilient robust economies, but that they are kind of preserving certain traits that we would associate with a college town, namely the kind of access to amenities, the safety, and the affordability while getting some of the more um, economical and innovative style benefits that you have from a major American city. And it's definitely a solid concept, but right when we left, I think we started to feel like, well, I don't know, actually, there's a couple of issues we wanted to kind of pick at here to really explore and broaden. You know, first, even those six cities, while there is undeniably something about those six that you can prove and we will confirm with data that connects them, there are some areas that if you start scratching those cities, you can see them splitting <coughs> off into their own sort of directions that are a little bit different. But beyond just that, we wondered, like, should only six cities meet the criteria to be a university city? Is it just a metric for success, right? Is it simply those college towns like Lexington and like Ann Arbor and like Madison that throughout time have best proven the ability to sort of innovate and grow while retaining the benefits of the college town? Or is it possibly that university city can be more of like a framework, kind of a way of tools that we build for understanding what happens to college towns when they grow? Right? I mean, this is 26 that we're going to identify in a moment we're looking at, but I mean, these are the kinds of cities that people are moving into into the next 50 years. There's no reason to believe why an Urbana-Champaign or a Fayetteville wouldn't grow into this eventually. And build on that even further, I mean, if we look at them in a little bit broader capacity, are we going to be able to notice other pathways of other cities? And so we tentatively titled this paper, What's the Deal with Syracuse? Kind of as a joke for our Jerry Seinfeld. And I mean no disrespect to Syracuse alums here. I almost went there. I was an Ithaca grad respect, myself. You do disrespect to Jerry Seinfeld. But I do mean yeah. a huge amount of disrespect to Jerry Seinfeld right here. So we have 26 <coughs> candidate cities that we are going to analyze and we're going to look at um, uh, today, or that we looked at in our paper. And today we'll touch on certain kind of metrics uh, to help you uh, understand kind of our process and what we visualized. So we followed the same criteria that was used in the initial analytics to isolate these cities. We tweaked them a little bit. So the cities would need to be at least 100,000 people within metropolitan statistical areas between 250K and a million. We kind of added the central city part just because we were noticing there's certain instances of a city that might be in someone else's MSA, but that's a little bit bigger. We want you to be the kind of main driving city for your MSA. Second was the university type and location. We want a centrally located university, but we were willing to expand beyond just the R1 research designation. We actually think it's better to kind of look at research spending maybe as an input for why they might be successful than a reason that you are kind of a university city. So we expanded a little bit. That's why you'll see like a Springfield, Missouri here or Brigham Young. Those aren't R1 research institutions, but they still have millions of dollars of research um, annually every year. And then finally was this idea of a university city and influence. I think this is one of the key parts that separates them. If you take their students, and in our opinion, we decided to take their students and employees, and you divide that by the city population, you get at least 10%. In some instances, like the case of Ann Arbor, you get all the way up to, what, 50 or so percent of the population is students and employees. And the reason we tweaked it to allow employees was we just felt like we wanted to get the entire um, or encapsulate sort of the entire impact of the university, and especially those that have broad kind of research and fellowship programs, like Duke uh, in Durham is a good example. If you only looked at the students in Durham, you'd have roughly about 6% of your population. But you factor in the employees and the researchers, you're suddenly up to 12 and 13%. So these are our cities. We're going to try to use their fighting logos as we go so we can kind of uh, keep moving through this presentation, and you can see and understand who and what they are. And we picked the same metrics generally of analysis from the original report and research, but expanded on a couple of them as needed to further um, 
kind of help with some of our arguments and to find the trends that we were after. So the ones that Scott is really mentioning here, economic resiliency and opportunity. How well do they weather economic downturns? What's the relationship between that and their educational kind of attainment levels? How affordable are they? You know, I mean, are incomes exceeding cost of living? What do the housing markets look like? And quality of life, are they safe from violent crime? Do they have high access to amenities? We also wanted to look a little more at population change to start, just so we could formally understand where they came from. You know, we use language in the paper, a new type of city has emerged. But have they emerged? Have they always kind of been here under plain sight? Are they current? And who possibly might be some of the university cities that are growing um, in time? The final piece in methodology before we can actually get into the, um, the numbers and the data, if we're framing this entire analysis as college towns that have grown up, right? You, Lexington and the other cities on this list, we would categorize you as a mid-sized city, right? You're 100,000, you're up to 300, 400,000. Then it was our feeling that to really understand how unique you are and where you're outperforming mid-sized cities and college towns, we actually need to build a sample of each. And if you're tracking alongside of them, then you're simply just acting like a mid-sized city in an area, or if you're tracking along a college town. But if you're demonstrating trends that far exceed or outside of the window of either, then I think we best get to that promise that a university city can actually be something kind of new, like a true new city that has emerged. So we don't have to go through all 100 and some cities here, but all the data you're seeing depicted for uh, the university cities in this project is also being collected for these cities as well. So before we dive into some of the trends, the last caveat I want to make is we chose a path to go up, right? We chose to go high to look at more cities and to look at a broad cross section of data. That means that we can't leave today necessarily with definitive conclusions about the one or the two thing. There are too many variables here, right? Too many things to necessarily control for. And so our real output and our goal that you're going to see is to depict some trends across these areas. And we feel that we've gotten to a point where we can segment these 26 university city candidates into five really clear categories. We're going to offer some kind of insight into what we're seeing in each of those cities, the trends that they share, and then pose some research questions where we and others feel we can kind of push this work uh, into a more specific area as we keep going. So with that, I will open then my kind of first attempt at some Tableau, or at least wanted to mention, sorry, one more thing here. I should have concluded with this is the problem of having multiple windows open. Uh, we're also big believers in shared and open data. Um, so we built this Tableau platform for university cities. This will be kind of left behind on the website. This compares all the data of every single city that we looked at. You'll notice some of these charts when we're going to go through our research in a second for how everything compares across a series of metrics. And it's built in a way that anybody can use it and interact with any city that they want. And hopefully internet pending and it doesn't fail. <sighs> it failed, did it? Did it? Maybe I'm just not in the internet. Hold on, let's try one more time. There we go. All right, pending, all of your metrics will switch. You can look at kind of a new city. So you can try to approach uh, similar or different conclusions from us. So first thing is the idea of population. So what we have kind of graphed here on this chart, and let me slide down so you can see the bottom of it too. So wow, it's tough to see with the glare there. So for those of you who aren't seeing, let me describe it to you. You have a bunch of orange lines here, and those orange lines are moving through space. Now the space that they're moving through here is their population in 1930 up to their population in 2016. These are all 26 of the university cities that we looked at. So I think the first thing that caught our eye is these three right here, right? There's three that are going to meet the criteria, but that took an absolutely opposite path to get to where they are going. New Haven, Syracuse, and Akron, Ohio. And you can also see if you look at certain variables here, I'm calling this out early because these are such outliers, right? They are post-industrial cities that have almost become a university city by default. They are this way now because they're losing population over time and the college influence has grown. Look at the average annual job creation in all other university cities is 2.8% a year. It's 0.37 in these three cities, right? The average poverty rate is 22% here. It's 12% in the other cities. The average unemployment rate, if you average 2010 to 2014, is almost 10%. It's roughly around 6% in the others. I call them out because the data would classify them, but we almost immediately need to put them into their own bucket of analysis because they would be dealing, in our opinion, with historic trends that many of the other cities would never have had to face. So that still leaves us with like a broad cross-section of 
uh, university city candidates. And I, I think one of the, you know, the coolest things we noticed right off the bat is we pose this concept of like a university city has emerged. And I think there's some examples of those that are, but another idea is maybe they've sort of always been here and kind of hiding in plain sight. I mean, a number of these cities have all reached 100,000 people by 1980. So not to date myself as being younger, but I wasn't born yet by the time that more than half of these cities had reached that kind of first tier benchmark of 100,000 and continued to grow onward from that. Um, even those that remained, you know, followed uh, a, a traditionally uh, nice trajectory of roughly around three to five percent growth annually to get to the point where they are nowadays. Last thing that we're not going to focus on, just because I don't want um, to accidentally overrun my time here, but just to again show them when you compare them to college towns, it's not that college towns don't also follow certain positive trajectory growth patterns over time. Even from a percentage standpoint, sometimes they're accurate. It's just that the overall numbers for the, a lot of these university cities were higher earlier and continued to grow at a faster and more accelerated rate. That said, I think it's always important to highlight those who may be on the horizon. We got an Athens, Georgia, really kind of creeping up in their population. Uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, and Las Cruces, New Mexico are other cities that are really kind of on the cusp of getting to this point where they would truly be uh, a mid-sized city. So if we have a sense of kind of where they came from, um, you know, one other thing that we want to introduce now that I'm going to come back to at one other point in this presentation is to actually understand if you look at a university city and you look at a college town and we maybe want to understand sort of how they have grown over time and what role alumni and students kind of remaining in that area have played in it, that's what we're trying to depict in a chart like this. So unfortunately it's sort of squishing it here. But what you have on the left is all of the university cities. We went to LinkedIn and we got their data, right? People graduate in 2017, where do you live now? People graduate in 2012, where do you live now? All the way back from 2002. And we plotted the same for any college town that we were able to find. And then what we drew in the middle here is kind of a moving median and a moving quartile. And I think what we found is like so fascinating about that is while both college towns and universities start the same, people who went to school there tend to remain behind in the first few years, there's a clear difference in how quick university cities really would drop off, right? They eventually get to a point where the median for people who've been out of school for roughly around 10 years or so, about 15% retention, where the university cities are hovering much higher at a number around 20 or 25%. So I'm introducing that now because I want to return to that in a bit because what also fascinated us about ranking that is you start to see your first instinct of some weird outliers kind of down here. Some university cities that are the same size have similar population compositions as a place like Lexington, but are dramatically underperforming in their long-term retention rates. So we'll come back to that as we try to offer some ideas of why that's the case. So in terms of population, right, our kind of main ideas here, the things that were most interesting to us that, that really went into our final research, they're not altogether new. You know, we feel like a lot of the candidates had uh, grown to a significant size before 400,000. Now maybe the, the composition of their cities had changed since then, but these have always been, for the most part, larger cities. Some of them are kind of more newly emerging, but these ones have come through time. There's three we need to highlight right away to always look at a little bit differently, just because they're facing socioeconomic and historical challenges that are so different from their peers. And then finally, using alumni retention data really kind of allows us to look at another area where we can clearly see the difference between university cities and college towns. So then the next area that we looked at, that we want to draw a couple trends from, that just squishes it in a terrible way, doesn't it? All right. Uh, execution, conception, here we go. What we have here in this extremely difficult to see, unfortunately, line graph that we're looking at here is plotting every single city's unemployment rate, 2007, 2010, 2012, 2014, and 2017. The blue over here on the left is the university cities. The yellow here in the middle is college towns, and everything over here green is mid-sized cities. So the first thing this jumped out to us is absolutely they are 100% like college towns, right? I mean, they track vastly below, if we were to drag in like a median, for example, and look, below comparison cities. There are a few outliers that hang up here at the top. Reno, who I'll show you in a moment, some idea about why they might be an outlier that has to do with where they're from. But other than that, it's the 
usual suspects, Akron, New Haven, and Syracuse. Every other city at the worst possible time in the economic downturn never exceeded 9.5% unemployment, even though major American mids, or sorry, mid-sized cities at that same time had a median or an average roughly of around 10 or 11%. So there's a couple of reasons for this, we think, or at least we found in our data. So the first one that we would look at here is, okay, maybe some of this can be explained to a degree by the state that they're in. And I do think that that is the case for a few of them we wanted to kind of call out right here. So like here's North Dakota, here's Nebraska, oh, oh dear, that's not going to do it. Sorry about that, gang. There we go. <clears throat> so Nevada disappeared because I wanted to show that too, but at least with North Dakota and Nebraska, for example, this is again, not at all to diminish what's going on in that city, but with cities like that, we need to understand that like the fact that Fargo or Lincoln's unemployment rate is hovering down at 3%, not by itself the most impressive when you consider the fact that Nebraska as a state never got below 4.2%, North Dakota never got below 3.8%. I mean, in one way, they're sort of responding to regional trends. But when you look compared to a state, that's one of the things that really allows some other cities to jump out way more. You know, so I'm highlighting Ann Arbor, for example, or Durham, or Gainesville, Tallahassee, Lexington, and Madison. If you look at what the average unemployment rate was like in their states, and then look where these cities were, in almost all cases, you were three percentage points or below. I mean, you're from Ann Arbor, you know this is nowhere more the case than a place like Ann Arbor, which I have to go all the way over to the left on my map to see what the unemployment rate was like in Michigan, to know how unique that was as a city to be located um, in Michigan and have unemployment rates that were that low. Um, I'm going to move past that one kind of real quick onto this chart right here. So we understand and we've seen in our data that our, un or our cities seem to be the university cities outside of those three outliers overperforming other cities of this size in terms of their economic resiliency for their unemployment rate. So to try to figure out why that might be the case, one thing we thought to actually plot here was, all right, why don't we plot what their, un or their uh, educational attainment is like? That's obviously a very good reason uh, that a city uh, of any size, if they have a highly educated population, may be able to weather the storm a little bit better. So that's what you'll see kind of down here on the bottom, is we've got all the university cities plotted in terms of their overall population. We have college towns plotted in terms of their overall percentage with bachelor's degree. And then you have kind of mid-sized comparison cities here. What you can visualize up here is if we take that and kind of put them on a percentile graph, right? So you can see if I was the University of Michigan, what percentile would I be compared to college towns? What percentile would I be compared to mid-sized cities up here? And I think that really sold it for us that almost every single one of our cities vastly outperforms mid-sized cities in terms of having right, a, a, a college-educated population. It's really only those uh, like Baylor who pops up or Akron or even Syracuse that are falling a little bit lower. And they're still sort of outperforming, if you find them on the chart, mid-sized cities. And this is important, right, if we just run a quick um, kind of scatter plot here and we look on the x-axis at the population with bachelor's degrees on the y-axis of the unemployment rate we did find you know it's not the strongest R R is about 0.45 but there is a statistically significant relationship between right, a highly educated population and here on the y-axis the unemployment rate so it'd be logical to assume that those cities like college towns or university cities because of who lives there and the population having bachelor's degrees would fare better in times of economic downturn because those types of jobs weren't hit necessarily as hard, like research that, um, that Richard Florida and others has shown. But there's more to it than just that. And I think this, and again, apologies if it's tough to see, I'll do my best to sort of walk through it. If outside of our kind of outliers, if one thing we're learning is that, okay, our university cities 
are good at creating jobs, they're good at weathering downturns, and they have lower rates of unemployment than other mid-sized cities. Well, let's look for what might be some of the other things in terms of their kind of uh, economic and employment data that differentiate. And so what we did here is we actually grabbed data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And on the x-axis, we plotted what is the, ag the average annual excuse me, growth of jobs. Right, so at what percentage are you growing your jobs every single year since 2012? And on the y-axis, we plotted how fast you're growing jobs for people of higher education, right? So you may be growing at a rate of 3%, but if you're only growing jobs that require a bachelor's degree at 1%, then you're kind of creating a system where people who have college degrees don't have as many opportunities overall uh, as those that might not. And that's was some of the most kind of fascinating stuff that we found. So we have our cities like Durham or Boulder or uh, Tuscaloosa or Reno, which are not only kind of growing pretty fast in the last five years, the number of jobs they're creating, but they're creating like roughly 4% and above for people with college degrees. So they're, they're kind of building like a market for uh, highly educated uh, populations. UK, we're all here in an extremely nice stable park, growing at about 2.3% a year and growing the number of jobs for people with higher education at about 2.3% a year. But you come down to these areas here, and this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Gainesville, Tallahassee. It's not that these cities aren't growing in the number of job opportunities for residents and people moving into them, but what we found is that the overall rate of job change is actually growing faster than the amount of jobs available for people who have um, bachelor's degrees. And I call this out as something important. Because if I return back to that one chart that we were interested in earlier in this presentation around retention, and I kind of change the, the visualization, so maybe I, here I'm just looking now at my university cities. And I've got kind of an average that'll calculate itself up here when I select some stuff. So if we like take ourselves 2007, that's like what, if you were a college town on a median in 2007, you get about 15% of your population kind of had remained behind or still living there from that time. So what you can see, right, refers to that idea that university cities on the whole do tend to track well above this. But it clearly highlighted a couple that are starting to behave or still behave kind of like a college town in terms of their long-term retention. And so if I drag and select some of these right here, What's kind of cool is that you can see that those same metrics, those cities, not like they weren't growing, right? The median job growth since 2012 was 2.3%, but in those cities, the median job growth required education was 1.2%. And these are the same ones that I had simply highlighted before. We have, um, you know, Duke's down there, but I would argue that for Durham, it's more related to the fact that they're a private school, same with Syracuse. If we look at just the public schools, University of Oregon, Texas A&M, University or Florida State University, uh, and then the University of Florida are down there as well. So it's kind of the first trend that we really found in our data that we're going to highlight in terms of a grouping later on, is that there seem to be a couple of um, these university cities that even if we look in some of the other metrics, are tracking alongside the kind of more successful university cities in terms of possibly low crime or you know resiliency to unemployment but they're really falling behind in this one key area which is that the creation of jobs for people who have higher education degrees and we think there's a relationship between that and their ability to retain alumni long term so in order to, to make sure i don't take up too much time and, and kind of um keep this thing moving I'll jump ahead to some of the cool trends or those that are most important that we saw in terms of affordability. This is, I think, you know, that whole last section in many ways reinforced some of the initial findings from university cities that they're more economically resilient, that they're highly educated. You know, we tried to call out some potential candidates that are different. But I think this is actually the area you'll see as I move through this section where our findings are a little bit different than, than the original sort of university cities research. So what we kind of did here for the first one, right, all right, we can plot the ratio of how much money you're making to how much it costs to live in one of these places. So if you're one, it's perfect, right? The average or median family income 
would equate to the median cost of living. And so this is definitely an area, I think, where university cities and college towns both track in a pretty positive direction here. However, if I kind of jump ahead and plot that a little bit differently, maybe I look on the y-axis here, I'm actually looking at the wage itself. And on the uh, axis here, I'm looking at the income itself. Well, you certainly have those like Boulder, like University, or sorry, Boulder, like Ann Arbor, like Madison, and like Fort Collins, that have extremely high wage or, or income to cost of living ratios. They're kind of well up on here. But we also start to see that there's some university cities when they get to a certain size. And these are the kind of other interesting ones to highlight, like a Knoxville, Tennessee, your neighbor three hours away, or Columbia, South Carolina, which really do seem to have kind of that low cost of living nominally compared to everybody, but haven't been able to achieve the same sort of average median wage growth. So it sort of separates them there. They're behaving more like their peers in mid-sized cities. But we can't just look at how much do I make and how much is the cost of living? Because we feel like that ignores one really key element, and that's students. I mean, if we look at uh, you know, the four big ones, or some of the big ones that we had highlighted in um, the conference last year, or Madison, or uh, in Ann Arbor, or a Lexington, I mean, you're looking at 150,000 or so students in all of those schools uh, combined right there. And if you look at data from iPads, you'd find that roughly on average between 18 and 22% are housed on campus. Right, so that's 80% that are gonna be looking for kind of housing. And this is the first area, if we plot like average two bedroom rents, for example, on the same thing, we took a rolling average from the census, from Zillow, from a bunch of sources, so we could try to get a solid number that reflects the market trends. Definitely an area where college towns stick together, right? Universally, college towns seem to have low absolute rents for two bedroom apartments as sort of a proxy. University cities are largely tracking in that way, but there are a couple that really find themselves headed over to the right. And if we try to analyze who those are, to the left would mean not affordable, to the right would mean affordable on this one. We can see that the ones that are down there are Madison, Fort Collins, Ann Arbor, poor unfortunate New Haven, which not only suffers from issues with lower kind of uh, overall incomes, but has high rents because of the area that it's in, and Boulder. And I think what's really tough about some of these cities, right, if I were to select them here, and my chart up here is actually going to show me kind of how much this has changed overall, you know, so, okay, university cities as a whole have increased uh, annually the amount that it costs to rent there by 0.27%. But these kind of select tier cities, some of the ones that we really highlighted last year, they've gone up by roughly 0.95% per year, right? So they're increasing in what it costs to rent there year over year at a faster rate than if I were to select some of the other cities, right, that are kind of in this sort of mid-tier range right here, 0.42%. So I was also going to show the same for uh, buying a house, but I want to make sure I don't lose the audience here and we run out of time. So I'm going to pop into kind of the last section and then hop to my conclusion so we can have discussion questions. So the last thing that we really looked at to keep ourselves um, uh, aligned with the original research is quality of life. And quality of life in the original research was primarily defined with how safe you felt, right? Your ability to have a city that doesn't have a high rate of violent crime and your uh, access to amenities. And so the first thing we've got here is we're depicting the violent crime. Another area where college towns really stick together. There is very few outliers that stray from kind of this overall uh, median and a, and a pretty small interquartile range that they are roughly below three uh, you know, incidents per 1,000 residents, whereas mid-sized cities are much, much kind of broader with an average that's around here. What we found fascinating was like the university cities we looked at, they literally live in like two different universes right here. There's the universes down here that behave like college towns, and then there's this strange cross-section of them up here that behave and have crime rates that are among the worst of some mid-sized American cities. And they're down here. And Durham is one of them. Columbia, South Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee. Maybe I jump to a map, and this is another thing that fascinated us. Most of them tend to be southern cities, right? With the exception of the outliers that we always need to bring our attention to, Akron, uh, Syracuse, and New Haven. 
every single one of those cities with the highest variable crime rate, highest violent crime, exists in the southern United States of America. So we did a little bit of kind of research onto that and nothing conclusive. It might relate to kind of the high historic rates of poverty within those cities. Um, other researchers have floated more dubious considerations that the history and the legacy of violence in the South is one of the reasons that southern cities tend to have higher crime. I don't feel we can comment on either of those. It's more a trend we found sort of fascinating. But what kind of made me more interested in this is, I'm gonna jump ahead real quick. Okay, safe, really safe, really unsafe and violent crime. But if I plot the same things also against a grid of kind of how much accessibility do you have to arts and entertainment and cultural amenities, a lot of access, a lot of access. What I found was kind of interesting is just because these cities down here that have some of the highest rates of crime, it doesn't necessarily make them also cities that don't have a high number and accessibility of amenities. I think this was most interesting for a city like Columbia or Knoxville or Gainesville or to a degree, and Gainesville's kind of hiding right here, I didn't select it by accident. Columbia, Knoxville, Florida State, Baton Rouge. They're interesting cities where crime is a facet. I mean, violent crime rates are high when you look at them as a citywide, but it's not necessarily like you're getting the same thing that might happen in a Syracuse or in Akron, where they're both suffering from issues of low access to uh, arts and cultural amenities and high rates of crime. So those were kind of the main trends, you know, if I tried to distill down what we saw in our research. And it led us ultimately to Try to differentiate and synthesize those trends to kind of conclude with what we think are like five key categories of how cities of this size, college towns that have sort of grown and are now at this mid-sized level, how they've emerged and where they find themselves now. So we mostly track with what we saw in the beginning uh, or from last year's research, but we do think actually we would move UK and, and, and Lincoln over here. We think the first category we call it the evolved college town, right? This is the best at fulfilling that promise that they fully emerged into kind of something overwhelmingly new and they're becoming these smaller scale economic powerhouses. They're innovative economies, they have high job creation rate, extremely high educated populations, high job creation rate, low crime, high amenities, but that's the big difference that we found. You know, in the initial research, even though their uh, median incomes in cities like that are higher and they're able to afford the higher cost of living, the rents we were showing and the kind of what it costs to purchase a home in that city is approaching rates of coastal American cities. So they are in effect behaving like coastal American cities, but they're bringing the baggage that happens around housing inequality with them. We feel there's a little bit different in what we call the matured college town. So that's Boise, that's University of Kentucky and Lexington, Lincoln, Nebraska, Lafayette, Louisiana, and Fargo. So, you know, we didn't show it here because I ran out of time, but we also collected data on startup creation from those universities and how many are retained locally. These cities probably don't create as many startups as some of the others, but they have good retention numbers. Those that are created tend to stay within the cities of their creation. They've got highly educated populations, but they're creating jobs at a rate to sustain those populations, low crime and high amenities, but they seem more able to retain the promise of affordability. Right? The incomes are still high, and the rents and the cost to purchase a home compared to the other cities and compared to other cities of this size remain lower. So that brings us, and I'm realizing these names are a little bit harsher than I meant them to be right now. I don't mean to, 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 to um, you know, impugn anyone from these, but when I call them a stunted college town, these are all grown to a certain size now. Gainesville, Florida State's almost 200,000. I mean, these are much bigger than college towns now, but they're expressing, particularly in terms of their education and their economy, these traits that are so much more similar to college towns. They're not retaining their graduates long term. They don't have uh, economic um, workforces that churn out uh, jobs for people with higher education at the same rate uh, as their overall <coughs> job growth. And in some instances, like the, the kind of College Station, for example, or Provo, even if they're meeting those metrics where they kind of fail to live past um, uh, the, the college town is that they haven't been able to grow their base and access of amenities at the same pace as some of the other schools. And I would say like our neighbor down to the south in Baton Rouge and Luddock are kind of interesting, difficult to classify one. If there were any that I was most interested to dive into further, 
it would be these because they do have huge schools and they have huge research, but they and their metrics aren't necessarily as challenged as a Syracuse and Akron or a Yale, but they seem to be kind of having more higher unemployment spikes than some of their peers. Their educational attainment is higher than the national average, but well below what you'd expect for a college town. Crime is really relative to geography here, and many of these are in the south, so that's why it's high. And the cost of living in a lot of these cities are low, but this relates back to that earlier graphic I showed that the income levels are also low. So they can't take advantage of the promise as much as a Lexington or a Lincoln, where the median income rates are high enough to establish those uh, costs of living. And then the final one, what we call a university city by default, I mean, they're just post-industrial cities. The university is now the major employer after historically not being so for years. I mean, I think I looked at Syracuse. I had a population at the school of 900 in 1955. That was the apex of their population. So ever since their population went down and the school sort of skyrocketed. But because they're dealing with their, their status as a post-industrial city, their economies have struggled at higher rates for decades. They have lower educational attainment and don't create the same level of jobs extremely high crime, lower tension, or uh, low concentration of amenities, and they happen to be hit with what I call hit from both ends right there. Not only do they, in cases of sometimes Syracuse and Yale, have high housing costs or high costs of living, but the uh, incomes are, are low as well. So that's where we've kind of found ourselves here. You know, as I mentioned, there's no definitive wow that we found one kind of variable that defines what it means to be a university city or why you've sort of grown. But where we feel like this is really valuable moving forward is if we can start to take a lot of schools that are hitting this point where they're reaching a certain size and get them into these sort of interesting categories of attributes and traits that are similar, it provides a really good stepping stone for kind of the next phase of policy making and research to fully understand, okay, what is going on at a Gainesville or a Florida State as to why they can't be, or sorry, a Gainesville or a Tallahassee, as to why they can't be churning out the same sort of uh, job growth for higher education numbers as say a Lincoln might or a Lexington might or several others. So thank you for going through the presentation there. I'll be ready to answer any kind of questions or comment or feedback and thanks again.